So our first reading this evening uh, can be found in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to be reading the first 10 verses. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4, and you can find that on page 1192 in the Red Church Bibles. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is, to re- if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to your brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And do take up these uh, um, uh, sheets here if you find them helpful to make notes on. And there's some questions to work through as well if you find that helpful to chew over the sermon later. Please do turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 as well. We're going to be flicking through there and elsewhere in Scripture. But do flick over to that. And while you're doing so, let me pray for us. Father, we know that your words are trustworthy and dependable, and we don't need uh, Paul's confirmation for that. Uh, Yet, as we look on tonight's trustworthy saying, we pray we may truly trust it so that we can uh, build our lives on its truth. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. So physical training is of some value, But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now I wonder, what are your thoughts at this moment in time towards physical training? Uh, I say that because it's mid-January, and I'm already uh, quite convinced we've got a few gym resolution dropouts uh, here this evening. Uh, I thought I'd let you know this evening, uh, I'm actually still going strong on my New Year's resolution. Uh, The gains are already apparent. Uh, My resolution wasn't to go to the gym, no. Actually, it was to stop paying for the gym that I don't go to. Uh, So I'm saving the tenor already. Now, in a much better way than myself, uh, many of us actually aspire to live healthily and to keep ourselves in good shape. The value of physical training is immediately apparent to us. It's easy to recognize. It's clear to understand how we are to achieve it. But we as Christians should aspire to more than just physical uh, well-being, but also spiritual well-being. And so maybe your resolutions this year were to be more stuck into God's word, or to be more open to serving God and his people. Or perhaps it was to be bolder in this year in sharing your faith with others. And what about becoming more godly? Did that make the cut for your New Year's resolutions? Because whilst physical training is of some value, godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, this is the trustworthy saying that we are going to explore tonight. And by God's grace and his spirit working within us, I hope we can all endeavor to apply this to our lives. Now, Paul is advising Timothy and the church he is ministering to in Ephesus 
that there are key ways in which we can keep ourselves in good spiritual shape. In fact, they're much the same as what we might do if we wanted to uh, keep in good physical condition. Firstly, we need to reject the junk. We need to feed on the good stuff. And we need to train daily. And then, then we will see the true value of godliness and why this is a trustworthy saying to take us through 2020 and beyond. So let's look at what it means to reject the junk. Now I wonder how many of you look to cut back on how much junk food you were going to eat this year. Uh, If I'm honest, I'm terrible for eating junk food. And whilst my metabolism is hard at work trying to keep up with me, I know that my poor fitness is in part due to the fact that I have such an intake of junk food. Now, it's obvious why it's bad for our physical condition. Overindulging in junk food means that our bodies uh, won't get the nutrition it requires. It means that it overloads on things like sugar and salt and fat that we only need in moderation. And that's why we call it junk food. We know it's no good for us. It's rubbish. And a core diet of junk food is sure to lead to damaging our body. Yet there is a kind of junk that can damage us spiritually, and we need to be wary of it. It's junk theology. This is what Paul identifies and calls Timothy to reject in the first three verses of our passage this evening. It seems that in Ephesus, a form of asceticism had set into the church there. Asceticism being the idea that one can achieve godliness through the abstinence of certain natural things. Now, we know this to be the case because Paul helpfully highlights this in verse 3, that these teachers were forbidding certain foods and even marriage. Now, this is clearly contrary to the Bible's teachings. In Mark 7, Jesus declares all foods to be clean. And since the garden, God created marriage to be between one man and one woman for his glory. Yet those, there were um, those at the time that would have preferred extinction to marriage. You see, abstinence in itself is not what leads to godliness, but rather abstinence from stupid ideas such as these ones. See, these ideas are junk. They just need getting rid of. Paul later in verse 7 says, have nothing to do with them. They are godless myths and old wives' tales. Ridiculous, laughable, and yet a potent weapon of the demonic to sway believers from the truth in the gospel and from godliness. You see, we find it today hard to imagine these ascetic ideals being attractive, don't we? But whilst the content has changed... We are still plagued with junk theology. This is because junk theology doesn't come from biblical understanding. Junk theology has its source in culture. And the reason asceticism was attractive was because the cultural environment in Ephesus was ripe for these ideas. They didn't come out of nowhere. They were a concoction of dodgy Jewish interpretations and Greek dualism. And that's why it was attractive then. Now, our modern society may have different ideals, but still it's ripe for junk theology. Much of today's junk theology is a concoction of dodgy biblical interpretations and cultural Marxism. But we need to be wary of it. So how can we identify junk theology? Well, we need to look at what it's grounded in. Junk theology lacks all substance because it has no grounding in Scripture. It just whimsical attempts at appeasing our social culture. Yet it's still attractive. Now, nobody thinks junk food is substantial, nutritious food, do they? But it tastes good. Now, similarly, junk theology is easy to swallow, but doesn't give us the truth that we need. Many of us find giving up junk food hard, don't we? Because we find that there's just so many outlets everywhere. It's just hard to avoid. Unfortunately, junk theology is just as prevalent 
And maybe more so today than at any other point in time. Now, outlets for junk theology, uh, theology aren't just godless clergy, but now, thanks to the internet, we're bombarded with it. It's amazing how many experts you see on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, but beware. The big difference between junk food and junk theology is that you can eat junk food and be all right. It's not that serious unless you make a habit of it, but you don't want to dabble with junk theology. Paul is explicit at the beginning of our passage this evening. Junk theology is demonic. It's why we shouldn't play around with falsehoods or be sucked into godless myths. Be rid of them, reject them, have nothing to do with them. Don't even have a taste. It's poison. Because if we continue to consume junk theology, then we will be desensitized to truth. Junk theology deadens our taste for what's good. It makes us uh, less able to discern truth from falsehood. And the people who propose these junk theologies have had their consciences seared. They're cauterized to the point where they're, they're clueless to the damage that they're doing to themselves and to their audiences. Reject junk theology so that your spiritual sense remains sharp and close to God's will. So rejecting junk is a good start. But in the pursuit of godliness, we also need to feed on the good stuff. Now, this is true for all training. If you take modern approaches to sport, for example, all the top athletes nowadays have nutritionists. Uh, they're really careful about what they eat, aren't they? It's not just to keep the bad stuff out, though. It's also to give them the necessary energy and nutrients for their exertions, for what they want to do. It's just as essential to eat well as it is to exercise well. Because without the right intake, they won't have the fuel for what they want to do. Now, Paul encourages Timothy in verse 6 to be nourished on the truths of faith and the good teaching that he has followed. Clearly, he's to maintain a healthy spiritual diet in his training. And this is encouraged throughout Scripture. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is by the Scriptures that God's servants are equipped for every good work, for training in righteousness. The scriptures equip us for the task. They are our fuel. We'll take another example. The psalmist in Psalm 1 declares, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his Lord day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. See, by delighting and meditating on God's word, we are well watered, as it were, so that we will live fruitful lives. Now, Jesus reaffirms what God taught the Israelites in the wilderness, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So just as bread was the essential food of the ancient world, God's word is the sustenance that keeps us spiritually alive. Yet in spite of all this, for all our busyness, for all our church activity, the first thing that gets pushed out of our daily routine seems to be the reading of his word. And it's really silly, isn't it? We want to run for the Lord in faith and with good motivations, we run, run, run with all our might for Jesus. Do this, do that, make this, make that. And then our running turns into jogging, turns into pacing, walking, plodding. Let me guess, um, many of you have felt like you've been crawling along for Jesus at some points. Tired, worn out, and after years of genuinely slogging it out, feel exhausted, spiritually spent. You see, that's the danger of running without the proper fuel. It was always going to happen. That's running 
in your own strength, which is really running on empty. You see, we need to dwell richly on God's word and good teaching. Life often feels so hectic, and so God's word is sidelined because we are too busy for him. The irony, however, is that the more we do, the more we need to depend on God's word. We need our spiritual diet to match our spiritual endeavors. And if our ambition is to train ourselves in godliness, then we need to be committed to God's word. So, how might we go about doing this? Here are some questions that you could ask yourself or work through with other believers to assess this. First one, is your spiritual diet sufficient? Are you spending enough time in God's word? Is it a regular occurrence to spend time in God's word and dwell on rich biblical teaching? When it comes to food, we know if we skip meals or if we don't have enough, we starve ourselves. Well, ask yourself, with the amount of time that you spend in God's word, are you satisfied or are you starving yourself of scripture? Next thing is, is your spiritual diet balanced? And by this I mean, are you only reading certain portions of scripture, maybe favorite psalms or favorite uh, passages, without wrestling with the rest of scripture? What, what about the parts that might not be the easiest to understand? Maybe the parts that might require poring over or further study to really grasp. You see, there's nothing wrong with favorite passages, but neglecting certain parts of the Bible will stunt our spiritual growth. Then, ask yourselves, is your spiritual diet nutritious? Are you digesting God's word so that God's truths are rooted within you? Are you reading and then forgetting? Or are you really get letting God's word sink in? Now, a great way to analyze this is whether you chat about the sermon you've just heard, or if you review the notes that you've made on Scripture, or if you recap what you've read. Maybe you could even commit some Scripture to memory to have it with you for all time. Now, there's many ways to do this, but make sure that God's Word sticks. And finally, have you got a taste for it? Now, I realize I'm probably in the minority here because people love their food. Uh, But there's that saying that goes, some people live to eat and others eat to live. Well, I'm in the latter category. I always have been, always will be. Um, As a child, fussy eater. As an adult, terrible cook. And I'm just not that into food. I just don't get it. I haven't got the taste for it. Yet when it comes to spiritual food, we shouldn't be like this. Now, have you got the taste for good spiritual food? Are we able to join with the psalmist in saying, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth? If we have the taste for uh, the goodness and richness of God's words, if we desire faithful biblical teaching, then surely our spiritual appetite will maintain our spiritual diet. Now, with the right diet, we can then move on to our training. And Paul states in verse 7, our training is in godliness. And the word godliness is from the Greek word eusebia. Its basic meaning is reverence, uh, although in the New Testament it's always referring to reverence to God. Therefore, to be godly is to be God-fearing. So how then do we train to be more God-fearing? Well, it follows that it is the purpose for which we have our spiritual diet. So just as our uh, physical diet is put to use in our bodies through exercise, so our spiritual diet is brought to fruition when we exercise what we have learnt through Scripture. In other words, we are not only to observe the Scriptures, but we are to obey the Scriptures. We are not to train ourselves to be merely God-acknowledgers, but God-fearers, obeying him in reverence and in awe. 
Now, in James 1.22, uh, we are warned to not merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves, but to do what it says. Therefore, if we as a church are resolved to take this trustworthy saying seriously, both for 2020 and beyond, then we are going to have a very active year, aren't we? You see, one way Christian fal- Christians falter in their faith is, as I mentioned previously, running with no spiritual diet and then running out of puff. Yet another way Christians can falter is by having a great spiritual diet, but never running on it. And what happens when you have a large diet but no exercise? Well, that diet is wasted. It's ineffective. And it only serves to make us more flabby. Let's not be flabby Christians. Because many of us may uh, find that we know the gospel inside out. Yet we don't tell the unbelievers around us about it. We may have memorized the fruits of the Spirit yet we don't practice them in our lives. We may know the dangers and warnings of sin. We may know God's ways, yet refuse to battle to put sin to death in our lives. And the result is a flabby Christian. All that diet, but no exercise. All that observance, but no obedience. Therefore, we must train daily. And practice what we know to be true from scripture and sound teaching. Now it's important for us to know that this isn't something that will just magically happen in our lives. Training is proactive. It's something we ourselves do. Now obviously we are enabled by the spirit uh, working within us. But we must take responsibility for our training. And training requires discipline. Now, we sometimes flounder at training in godliness uh, because we think if we put disciplines in place to help us obey God, then we must be legalists. But legalism is a a problem with our motives, not our actions. If when we think our training will somehow earn God's favor, that's when we're straying into legalism. If we know our standing with God is based on Christ's performance, based on God's grace. And we won't be afraid of discipline. So let's be proactive. Let's be diligent. And with great vigor, train ourselves in godliness. So what's the incentive? The incentive for us to apply this to our lives for 2020 and beyond. Why exercise on tonight's diet? Why is this saying trustworthy? Because let's not kid ourselves. There's a reason why getting the right diet and training is, is hard. And training in godless even more so. It's hard because it requires so much effort and commitment. Paul doesn't shy away from this. In verse 10, he says, this is why we labor and strive. It's hard work. It's the blood, sweat, and tears kind of language. It's the pump iron until you can't do no more then do another rep kind of language. It's hard, but it's worth it. Now, there was a news piece this week on our British Olympic rowing team, uh, and they are undergoing training at the moment at altitude. And you should see what they're getting up to at the moment. Uh, They are these giants of men. They're, They're so physically fit, and yet... They're just collapsing after their sessions. They're being put into recovery positions. Uh, The amount of uh, of carbs they're taking every day is just ridiculous. They're just scoffing egg and toast whenever they can. And emotionally, uh, it's clearly taking its toll on these tough, tough men. Uh, One of the men being interviewed was asked whether it was worth it all. And he just burst into tears on camera. Uh, He competed in the last Olympics... And yet he walked away without a medal. And he felt he had nothing to show for himself, for his family, for all the training he had done. You see, the intensely grueling training was only worth it if he got gold. That's the goal for every athlete that's over there at the minute. Gold. It makes it all worthwhile. All their 
appalling experiences. It's, it's worth it if they could just get gold. You see, for these men, the value of their uh, training will be decided by the medal they receive. So certainly, physical training has some value. It can keep us fit and healthy. It may even uh, be for some of us that we might celebrate sporting victory and glory. But its value is limited. Be encouraged in your training because godliness has unlimited value. It holds promise both for this life and the life to come. Now, the extent of its value is unmatched. Godliness has value for your marriage, value for you as parents, value for you as children. Godliness has value for your contentment, for your joy, for your wisdom. Godliness has value for you as an employee. It has value for you as an employer. Godliness has value for your evangelism, for your hospitality, your perseverance, your character. You see, there's no end to the benefits of godliness. The extent of its value surpasses all of its applications. There is no area of your life that being more God-fearing will not be of value to you. Therefore, prioritize godliness. It's far greater than shaving a few pounds or increasing the size of your biceps, even greater than Olympic gold. Then consider that the value of godliness is everlasting. Now, have you ever tried some form of uh, exercise or sport and then taken a break away from it? What happens when you go back? You see, you're nowhere near the level that you were before. It takes twice as long as the amount of time you took off to get back to where you were. And naturally, there's a ceiling, isn't there, to what we can do. No one's superhuman, not even our Olympians. But godliness is valuable, not just for a small time, but for all time. It is something that will continue on into eternity. We will never stop growing in our love and awe of God. Now, have you ever thought about that? God is infinite. His love and grace, mercy and wisdom, power and glory will never dull with age. And in fact, in eternity, we will be unhindered from continually being more and more enthralled with God. And our reverence for him will only ever increase. So when training in godliness, remember this trustworthy saying. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come.